gosh, this is amazing. It's, it's a letter and it's, it, it's addressed to me. I wonder what it might say. Ah, oh, 12th of June, 1962. It didn't take that long to get here. In those days, post arrived the following morning, early, and it only cost 3D. <clears throat> That's about a penny halfpenny, just under a penny halfpenny. Oh, oh and, it, uh, and it's from a girl. Well, that, that, that's amazing. <clears throat> Was I excited to read this? No, I'm not going to tell you what it said. <clears throat> <clears throat> was I excited? Of course I was. Did I read it avidly from start to finish? Yeah, of course I did. You bet I did. Or, or did I say to myself, well, that's good, I'll read the second page tomorrow, and the third page the week after, and, and so on and so forth, like we do the Bible today. How did the people of Ephesus react, do you think, when they received a letter from Paul? Were they excited? Would they have read it avidly? Would they have wanted to know what gems Paul had to share with them? You bet they did. I have here a conveyance of this land in Whitchurch. It's dated the 18th of November, 1780. It was, a, it was handwritten, needless to say, on vellum. Very important document. It conveyed uh, shops and houses in this area between the High Street and whatever street uh, was at that point next door. 840 pound they paid for this site during the reign of George III in good and true money. <laughs> Both that letter from my girlfriend who happens now to be my wife for 58 and a half years, and this conveyance written, were, they were both written in the language of the day. And both would have been read in their entirety. I mean, who wouldn't l read a legal document in its entirety? Or a love letter in its entirety? And the same applies to the Ephesians, of course, which is why this morning we have a long reading, because we are going to read the book, the letter of Ephesians. And why are we reading it? Because I can't trust you to do it at home. <laughs> I couldn't trust me to do it at home either. If I said to me, read the letter of Ephesians during this week, phew, I'd have forgotten it by the time we went out of that door. <laughs> so we're going to read it. We're not going to read it divided into chapters. We're going to read it straight through. Chapters were invented uh, a little later on for the convenience of the printers. And we're going to read it in the conversational language of J.B. Phillips. Does this mean that it's wrong to study small chunks of the letter? as we will be doing over the coming weeks. Of course it doesn't. But it does give us uh, an insight into the whole letter, to understand the whole um, idea of what he was trying to portray to the people in Ephesus. So Barbara's going to start us off. Do try to stay awake. I'm a bit shorter than Ken. Ready? Paul, 
messenger of Jesus Christ by God's choice to all faithful Christians at Ephesus and other places where this letter is read. Grace and peace be to you from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to God for giving us, through Christ, every possible spiritual benefit as citizens of heaven. For consider what he has done. Before the foundation of the world, he chose us to become, in Christ, his holy and blameless children, living within his constant care. He planned, in his purpose of love, that we should be adopted as his own children through Jesus Christ that we might learn to praise that glorious generosity of his, which, was made, which has made us welcome in the everlasting love he bears towards the Son. It is through the Son, at the cost of his own blood, that we are redeemed, freely forgiven through that full and generous grace which has overflowed into our lives and opened our eyes to the truth. For God had allowed us to know the secret of his plan, and it is this. He purposes in his sovereign will that all human history shall be consummated in Christ, that everything that exists in heaven or earth shall find its perfection and fulfilment in him. And here is the staggering thing, that in all which will one day belong to him, we have been promised a share since we were long ago destined for this by the one who achieves his purposes by his sovereign will. So that we, as the first to put our confidence in Christ, may bring praise to his glory. And you too, when you trusted him, when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And after you gave your confidence to him, you were, so to speak, stamped with the promised Holy Spirit as a guarantee of purchase until the day when God completes the redemption of what he has paid for as his own, and that will again be to the praise of his glory. Since, <clears throat> since then I heard of this faith of yours in the Lord Jesus, and the practical way in which you are expressing it towards fellow Christians. I thank God continually for you, and I never give up praying for you. And this is my prayer, that God, the, the God of the Lord Jesus Christ and the all-glorious Father will give you spiritual wisdom and the insight to know more of him that you may receive that inner illumination of the Spirit which will make you realize how great is the hope to which he is calling you. The magnificence and splendor of the inheritance promised to Christians and how tremendous is the power available to us who believe in God. That power is the same divine power which was demonstrated in Christ when he raised him from the dead and gave him the place of supreme honor in heaven, a place that is infinitely superior to any conceivable command, authority, power, or control, and which carries with it a name far beyond any name that could ever be used in this world or in the world to come. God has placed everything under the power of Christ and has set him up as head of everything for the church, for the church is his body, and in that body lives fully the one who fills the whole wide universe. To you, who were spiritually dead all the time that you drifted along in the streams of this world's e ideas of living and obeyed its unseen ruler, who is still operating in those who do not respond to the truth of God. To you, Christ has given life. We all lived like that in the past and followed the impulses and imaginations of the e our evil nature being, in fact, under the wrath of God by nature like everyone else. But even though we were dead in our sins, God, who is rich in mercy because of the great love he has for us, gave us life together with Christ. 
It is, remember, by grace and not by achievement that you are saved and has lifted us right out of the old life to take our place with him in Christ in the heavens. Thus, he shows for all time the tremendous generosity of the grace and kindness he has expressed towards us in Christ Jesus. It was nothing you could or did achieve. It was God's gift to you. No one can pride himself upon earning the love of God. The fact is that we are, that the fact is that what we are, we owe to the hand of God upon us. We are born afresh in Christ and born to do those good deeds which God planned for us to do. Do not lose sight of the fact that you were born Gentiles, known by those whose bodies were circumcised as the uncircumcised. You were without Christ. You were utter strangers to God's chosen community, the Jews, and you had no knowledge of or right to the promised agreements. You had nothing to look forward to and no God to whom you could turn. But now, through the blood of Christ, you who were once outside the pale are with, it, are with us inside the circle of God's love and purpose. For Christ is our living peace. He has made a unity of the conflicting elements of Jew and Gentile by breaking down the barrier which lay between us. By his sacrifice, he removed the hostility of the law with all its commandments and rules and made in himself out of the two, Jew and Gentile, one new man, thus producing peace. For he reconciled both to God by the sacrifice of one body on the cross and by this act made utterly irrelevant the antagonism between them. Then he came and told you both who were far from God and us who were near that the war was over and it is through him that both of us now can approach the Father in one spirit. So you are no longer outsiders or aliens but fellow citizens with every other Christian. You belong now to the household of God. Firmly beneath you in the foundation God's messengers and prophets the actual foundation stone being Jesus Christ himself. In him, each separate piece of building, properly fitted into its neighbour, grows together into a temple consecrated to God. You are all part of this building in which God himself lives by his spirit. It is in this great cause that I, Paul, have become Christ's prisoner for you Gentiles. For you must have heard how God gave me grace to overcome to become your minister and how he allowed me to understand his secret by giving me a direct revelation. What I have written briefly of this above will explain to you my knowledge of the mystery of Christ. This secret was hidden to past generations of mankind, but it has now by the spirit been made plain to God's consecrated messengers and prophets. It is simply this, that the Gentiles, who were previously excluded from God's agreements, are to be equal heirs with his chosen people, equal members and equal partners in God's promise given by Christ through the gospel. And I was made a minister of that gospel by grace he gave me and by the power with which he equipped me. Yes, to me, less than the least of all Christians has God given this grace to enable me to proclaim to the Gentiles the incalculable riches of Christ and to make plain to all men the meaning of that secret which he who created everything in Christ has kept hidden from the creation until now. The purpose is that all the angelic powers should now see the complex wisdom of God's plan being worked out through the church in conformity to that timeless purpose which he centred in Jesus our Lord. It is in this same Jesus, because we have faith in him, that we dare, even with confidence, to approach God. In view of these tremendous issues, I beg you not to lose heart because I am now suffering for my part in bringing you the gospel. Indeed, you should be honoured. 
when I think of the greatness of this great plan, I fall on my knees before God the Father, from whom all fatherhood, earthly or heavenly, derives its name. And I pray that out of the glorious riches of his resources, he will enable you to know the strength of the Spirit's inner reinforcement, that Christ may actually live in your hearts by your faith. And I pray that you, firmly fixed in love yourselves, may be able to grasp, with all Christians, how wide and deep and long and high is the love of Christ. And to know for yourselves that love so far beyond our comprehension. May you be filled through all your being with God himself. Now to him who by his power within us is able to do far more than we ever dare to ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church through Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. As God's prisoner then, I beg you to live lives worthy of your high calling. Accept life with humility and patience, making allowances for each other because you love each other. Make it your aim to be at one in the spirit and you will inevitably be at peace with one another. You all belong to one body of which there is one spirit, just as you all experienced one calling to one hope. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of us all, who is the one over all, the one working through all, and the one living in all. Naturally, there are different gifts and functions. Individually, grace is given to us in different ways out of the rich diversity of Christ's giving. As the scripture says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Note here the implication. To say that Christ ascended means that he must previously have descended, that is, from the height of heaven to the depth of this world. The one who made this descent is identically the same person as he who has now ascended high above the very heavens, that the whole universe, from lowest to highest, might know his presence. His gifts to men were varied. Some he made his messengers, some prophets, some preachers of the gospel. To some he gave the power to guide and teach his people. His gifts were made that Christians might be properly equipped for their service, that the whole body might be built up until the time comes when in the unity of the common faith and common knowledge of the Son of God, we arrive at real maturity, that measure of development which is meant by the fullness of Christ. We are not meant to remain as children at the mercy of every chance wind of teaching and the jockeying of men who are expert in the craft presentation of lives, lies. But we are meant to hold firmly to the truth in love and to grow up in every way into Christ, the head. For it is from the head that the whole body as a harmonious structure knit together by the joints with which it is provided grows by the proper functioning of individual parts to its full maturity in love. This is my instruction then, which I give you from God. Do not live any longer as the Gentiles live, for they, have, they live blindfold in a world of illusion and cut off from the life of God through ignorance and insensitiveness. They have stifled their consciences and then surrounded themselves to sur surrender themselves to sensuality practicing any form of impurity which lust can suggest. But you have learned nothing like this from Christ, if you have really heard his voice and understand the truth that he has taught you. No, what you have learned was to fling off the dirty clothes of the old way of living, which were rotted through and through with lust's illusions, and with yourselves mentally and spiritually remade to put on the clean, fresh clothes of the new life 
which was made by God's design for righteousness and the holiness which is no illusion. Finish then with lying and tell your neighbor the truth. For we are not separate units, but intimately related to each other in Christ. If you are angry, be sure that it is not out of wounded pride or bad temper. Never go to bed angry. Don't give the devil that sort of foothold. If you used to be a thief, you must not only give up stealing, but you must learn to make an honest living so that you may be able to give to those in need. Let there be no more foul language, but good words instead, words suitable for the occasion which God can use to help other people. Never hurt the Holy Spirit. He is, remember, the personal pledge of your eventual full redemption. Let there be no more resentment, no more anger or temper, no more violent self-assertiveness, no more slander and no more malicious remarks. Be kind to each other, be understanding, be as ready to forgive others as God, for Christ's sake has forgiven you. As children copy their fathers, you as God's children are to copy him. Live your lives in love, the same sort of love which Christ gives us and which he perfectly expresses when he gave himself up for us in sacrifice to God. But as for sexual immorality in all its forms and the itch to get your hands on what belongs to others, don't even talk about such things. They are not fit subjects for Christians to talk about. The keynote of your conversation should not be nastiness or silliness or flippancy, but a sense of all that we owe to God. For of this much you can be certain, that neither the immoral nor the dirty-minded nor the covetous man, which latter is in effect worshipping a false god, has any significance, inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Don't let anyone fool you on this point, however plausible his argument. It is these very things which bring down the wrath of God upon the disobedient. Have nothing to do with men like that. Once you were darkness, but now you are light. Live then as children of the light. The light produces in men quite the opposite of sins like these. Everything that is wholesome and good and true. Let your lives be living proofs of the things which please God. Steer clear of the activities of darkness let your lives show by contrast how dreary and futile these things are. You know the sorts of things I mean. To detail the, their secret doings is really too shameful. For light is capable of showing up everything for what it really is. It is even possible, after all it happened to you, for light to turn the thing it shines upon into light also. Thus God speaks through the scriptures. Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Live life, then, with a due sense of responsibility, not as men who do not know the meaning and purpose of life, but as those who do. Make the best use of your time, despite all the difficulties of these days. Don't be vague, but firmly Grasp what you know to be the will of God. Don't let your stimulus stim, don't let your stimulus from wine. For there is always a danger of excessive drinking. But let the spirit stimulate your souls. Express your joy in singing among yourselves psalms and hymns and spiritual sing, songs, making music in your hearts. For the ears of God. Thank God at all times for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and fit in with each other because of your common reverence for Christ. You wives must learn to adapt yourselves to your husbands as you submit yourselves to the Lord. 
For the husband is the head of the wife in the same way that Christ is the head of the church and saviour of the body. The willing subjection of the church to Christ should be reproduced in the submission of wives to their husbands. But remember, this means that the husband must give his wife the same sort of love that Christ gave to the church when he sacrificed himself for her. Christ gave himself to make her holy, having cleansed her through the baptism of his word, to make her an altogether glorious church in his eyes. She is to be free from spots, wrinkles, or any other disfigurement, a church holy and perfect. Men ought to give their wives the love they naturally have for their own bodies. The love a man gives his wife is the extending of his love for himself to enfold her. Nobody ever hates or neglects his own body. He feeds and looks after it. And that is what Christ does for his body, the church. And we, were, we are all members of that body. We are his flesh and blood. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The marriage relationship is doubtless a great mystery, but I am speaking of something deeper still, the marriage of Christ and his church. In practice, what I have said amounts to this. Let every one of you who is a husband love his wife as he loves himself, and let the wife reverence her husband. Children, the right thing for you to do is to obey your parents as those whom God has set over you. The first command is, sorry, the first command to contain a promise was, honour your father and mother that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, don't overcorrect your children or make it difficult for them to obey the commandment. Bring them up with Christian teaching in Christian discipline. Slaves, obey your human masters sincerely with a proper sense of respect and responsibility a service rendered to Christ himself, not with the idea of currying favour with men, but as the servants of Christ, conscientiously doing what you believe to be the will of God for you. You may be sure that God will reward a man for good work, irrespectively of whether the man be slave or free. And as for you employers, be as conscientious and responsible towards those who serve you as you expect them to be towards you neither misusing the power over others that has been put in your hands, nor forgetting that you are responsible yourselves to a heavenly employer who makes no distinction between master and man. In conclusion, be strong, not in yourselves, but in the Lord, in the power of his boundless resource. Put on God's complete armour so that you can successfully resist all the devil's methods of attack. For our fight is not against a physical enemy, it is against organizations and powers that are spiritual. We are, are up against the unseen power that controls this dark world and spiritual agents from the very headquarters of evil. Therefore, you must wear the whole armor of God that you may be able to resist evil in its day of power. And that even when you have fought to a standstill, you may still stand your ground. Take your stand then with truth as your belt, righteousness your breastplate, the gospel of peace firmly on your feet, salvation as your helmet, and in your hand the sword of the Spirit, the word of God. Above all, be sure you take faith as your shield for it can quench every burning missile the enemy hurls at you. Pray at all times with every kind of spiritual prayer, keeping alert and persistent as you pray for all Christ's men and women. And pray for me too, that I may be able to speak freely to make known the secret that, of that gospel for which I am, so to speak, an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may speak about, what, about it as my plain and obvious duty. Tychicus, beloved brother and faithful minister, will tell you personally what I am doing and how I am getting on. 
I am sending him to you, bringing this letter for that purpose, so that you will know exactly how we are and may take fresh heart. Peace be to all Christian brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be to all those who sincerely love our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul. Oh, Barbara, that was amazing, wasn't it? To think that Paul has written to us and given us all that information, that encouragement, those instructions. Just amazing. I think we should read it again. Yeah, should we do <laughs> it now? Joking. <laughs> so that is what the church in, in Ephesus would have read. And... I think they would have spent quite a while having read it, talking about it, and going over it. And in the coming weeks, we will be going over it uh, in little bite-sized pieces. Well, fairly little bite-sized pieces. And we will learn a great deal more about what Paul was saying to the Ephesian church. Well done for staying awake. Well, some of you did, anyway. And... uh, And it's really good to read a whole passage of Scripture. Dave.